I want to continue our discussion about requirements and requirements management by giving an overview of functional and non-functional requirements. When you hear the term functional requirements, this refers to a function of a system or a component. It looks to the inputs, behaviors, outputs. It specifically says what the system should do. These are typically the requirements that you've been developing in this course. When you think about what makes a good requirement, it's helpful that it's unambiguous, so it's clear and easy, be easily understood. It's testable, it's clear, understandable. The requirement is actually feasible, it's independent, traceable, necessary, as well as implementation free. Often as IT professionals, we try to specify the requirement in a way that determines how the requirement should be implemented. But really, we're trying to develop the business requirements that speak to just the main business need. The implementation of that business need is up to the systems analyst and the rest of the development team to determine. Another way that we document requirements, and you saw this in pre previous chapters, was using user stories. And user stories can be broken down into the INVEST acronym. And INVEST stands for independent, negotiable, valuable, estimable, small, and testable. So as we start developing user stories, we want the requirements to be independent. So each story can stand on its own. Uh, we should also be able to negotiate these stories. As you come up with large requirements, we need to be able to split those stories and negotiate as to what actually goes into a story rather than uh, creating a different story. With each of these stories, we wanna make sure that they are indeed valuable. So we're actually implementing a business requirement that makes sense, and we need to be able to estimate them. If you can't estimate, it's gonna be a difficult, uh, difficult to work with that user story. So you should look to further split those user stories into smaller requirements to a point that the team can actually estimate how long it will take to turn that requirement into a working software solution. We're also a big fan of making sure these user stories are small. Having small, concise requirements are helpful to a developer so they can actually understand what requirement they're trying to de develop. And the culmination of those small requirements will lead to a larger functioning system. And of course, the requirement needs to be testable. If you can't actually test the requirement, you need to go back in and review and revise how that requirement could be written so it could indeed be testable. So here's an example of how you can write some user stories. Let's say you're going to develop a, an iPhone application and you want to enable a school permission slip. So in this case, the instructors and the students, they need to be able to issue a permission slip for a field trip. Once that parent signs the permission slip using the application, the principal will run a report identifying the different completed slips and missing parents' approval. And you can use this in a couple different ways. One of the, the most common formats for user stories is you can say, as a user, I want a specific function so that it provides whatever the certain value is going to be. So in this example, one user story could be, as the principal, I want to run a report that identifies all the completed permission slips so the students, so I will know what students go on the specific field trip. You could also write a user story that says, as a principal, I want to run a report that identifies the incompleted permission slips so I can identify which students are missing parent approval. Those are just two different examples of how you can do this. Uh, but as you develop these different requirements and different features, they become backlog items uh, in, in your product backlog. So depending on how you approach your systems analysis and design, you'll be adding requirements to a document or adding requirements to a product backlog. For those of you that you went through the Trello example, you've seen how we built out the backlog of requirements in our Trello list. And from there, we'd be able to pick those requirements and actually implement them. Then of course, we get into non-functional requirements. Non-functional requirements are important elements to consider because they all speak about the properties that the product must have. So these help to describe the experience the user has while doing the work. Now they're called out in a way that their customer wants, they also need to be performed in a certain manner. Now it's also important to notice that they don't alter the product's functionality. The functional requirements help describe what they want to have happen, and the non-functional requirements will help describe the experience the user has while doing the work. You can see this by using adjectives as a way to describe how the system should work. So for example, 
when you use a website, you want to make sure the response time responds in a timely manner. So you can have a functional requirement that says the website loads within two seconds. Or when you process a form, you get a response within a two second time, time frame. You may also have to specify the capacity of the system. How much disk space is needed? How, much, how, how are you going to plan for growth of the system as you add more users to it? What about service level agreements? When you actually launch a system, how are you going to ensure that the system will be kept up and running? And if you have an external vendor managing the system for you, what service level agreements are you going to be putting into place? How maintainable is the system? We all want our data to be secure. So what type of security goes behind those systems? How are you managing the system? What about legal and regulatory requirements? And then we get into the actual architecture layers of how is the application built? What's the underlying data architecture? What about the technology stack? And what about the network architecture? All these become non-functional requirements that you need to start identifying. And then you can think about how you're going to roll out the system. It gets into a little bit of organizational design and change management. Training is often a key deliverable out of a system, but those form their own set of requirements that are going to be needed to help roll out the system and communicate to your target audience. Also thinking about support and maintenance, how usable is the system? Where is the system actually located? How are you going to deliver, deploy the application? Uh, what about development standards, as well as overall software configuration management? Thinking through where you're going to store your code, how the code is going to be developed. These are all non-functional requirements that they don't impact, well, they, they do impact the usability of the application, but they're not specifically stated in the form of a function that's going to deliver a direct business value. But if you don't have these non-functional requirements thought of, you can definitely impact the quality of your application. So let's look at the security example. Employees shall be forced to change their password the next time they log in if they have not changed it within the length of time established as the password expiration duration. Passwords should never be viewable at, any, at the point of entry or any time within the system. The access permissions for the system data may only be changed by the system administrator. These are all business rules that need to be baked into the system, but you see none of these rules end up delivering a functional component, such as I'll develop a report, um, but, or but you'll see the example here that you're using this to find a way to determine what your password rules should be. So in this case, you gotta change your password next time. So these are all going to requirements that build out those modules. Accessibility. This is an important one within the system. The system needs to be accessible to people with disabilities in accordance with, American, with Americans with Disabilities Act of 1990. Accessibility on websites is becoming more and more popular of a topic as we wanna make sure that everybody can view data within our websites, even if they have a disability, as we need to make sure we are writing code appropriately for the target audience. The system shall be accessible by people who are colorblind to the extent that they should be able to discern all text and all the other information displayed by the system as easily as a person without color blindness. It's a key feature because folks with color blindness actually still buy a lot of products online. Availability. The online payment system shall be available for use between the hours of 6 a.m. and 11 p.m. The system shall achieve a 99.5% uptime. These are all requirements that still need to be considered as you're building out your application although it may not directly specify a feature that a business user will perform. So when you look at non-functional requirements that you run in for every application, uh, you can, this is divided across a number of different categories, including performance, availability, maintainability, capacity and scalability, and recovery. So often we look at response times, processing times. When you're running a report, how fast should a report run? You know, if you run a large report or a large query, What's the expected time that the business user will accept before they start complaining and saying that the system's not usable? Uh, when you think about capacity and scalability, how many transactions can the system handle? What happens if you receive thousands of orders all at once? How are you, how are you ensuring you're scaling your application? Uh, when you think about your data, how much data will be stored? Where will you store it? And how will that, that data be encrypted? It's very important in today's day and age as more of our personal personally identifiable information is brought out to the web that we know how that data is being handled as well as how is it being stored and encrypted uh, given all the different data leaks that we've seen in the organization. 
Availability is also a concern. What are the specific hours of operation? When can the system actually go down for maintenance? And where's the location of the application? If you have your server located in North America, but your users are over in Europe, how are you ensuring that the application is available and there isn't any network latency that can impact the performance of the system? Thinking about maintainability, are we developing the software using standard solutions? Or are these one-offs that are developing software in a language that only a few people understand? Think about the coding standards as well, what language and what coding frameworks are being used. And a big one too is recovery. So when you think of restoration time, how long before the application is back up, as well as backup time, how long do you back up the data? Because you need to be able to understand how long does it take to not only restore the application, but if you were to restore a day's worth of data, would that be sufficient to maintain your business process? Or do you need data to be restored up to the very hour or the half hour? All those form requirements that the application team needs to determine while they're building their system. Another way of viewing requirements too is when you look at the must, want, and assumptions. So all requirements, be them functional or non-functional, they can be further decomposed into musts, wants, and assumptions. So a must is clearly a time critical requirement that must be achieved or delivered within the current release of the solution. Other requirements are wants. It's a requirement that's wished for, but it can be deferred until a later release. Uh, so in Agile terms, or even using Scrum, we think of this as a separate user story. Because remember, we want to break down those requirements into smaller chunks so we can deliver accordingly. And then assumption, it's the expectation on part of the project team. Now, these may include other dependencies and other project teams, timing considerations, or just overall characteristics that you are making assumptions about and how the system is actually going to function. Now, another way to view all your requirements is by using a requirements traceability matrix. And the requirements traceability matrix, it's usually in the form of an Excel document or a table and allows you to help maintain a master list of all the requirements. And the other piece is it allows you to start identifying all the test cases that need to be written to verify those requirements are being achieved. So then you can track in the log and you track the status of each requirement and how often have the requirements been tested, reviewed, and ensured that the application is functioning as desired. Because in a system implementation, you can generate hundreds of different requirements, but if you don't track those requirements, how are you ensuring the requirements are delivered on time? This is an example, and the link is here in the, the deck, but it's a simple Excel document where you've got technical assumptions, functional requirements, what's the status, and you can actually list links to the architecture document, the technical specification, the system components. But you see here under the column uh, software module and test case number, those are two key attributes to identify the requirement as well as the test case that is used to ensure that the system is, is properly tested and, and functioning.